Hello, I'm Lubila Yakhmilita, professor at the Institute of International Relations and Political Science, which is in Vilnius University. We continue our topic on narratives of Europe and the uses of past. In this video, I want to talk about one particular category of Europe, Eastern Europe, what the idea of Eastern Europe means, and its peculiar position in the debates about Europe, as Eastern Europe is a part of Europe and the other inside of Europe. So, I will explain how this idea of Eastern Europe came about, what it means, how it, de how it developed, and what challenges the concept creates for us nowadays. I guess that most of you, if you live in Europe, and if you asked about what association you get when hearing the words Eastern Europe, would give me some answer. So, remember this while I keep talking and compare. Geographically, Eastern Europe consists of countries that are on the eastern flank of Europe. Not surprisingly, there is no definite answer which states should be included. For example, some maps show that Eastern Europe consists of countries from the former Soviet Union. Some, such as United Nations Statistics Division, add countries from the former Socialist Bloc, but exclude three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, which in this version are said to belong to Northern Europe. I must notice that this version is the least popular or known. Finally, as you can see in the, in the last map, sometimes countries in the southeast that before 1991 were part of the former Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia are also included. Still, these disagreements are not a significant hindrance to talk about the idea itself, which is more than just the states and territories on the map. The concept of Eastern Europe is an old idea. Historian Larry Wolf, in his book Inventing Eastern Europe, published in 1994, asserts that Eastern Europe was invented in 18th century. Invented means that category didn't exist before the indicated time, and these descriptive words are not a natural description of a type of people. According to Larry Wolf, the idea of Eastern Europe was created by Western Europeans in the Enlightenment era when the notion of civilization was formulated. Together with it, the concept of backward, uncivilized people came into existence as well. This dichotomy, civilized, uncivilized, gives the conceptual map to understand the wider world for the people. Wolf's book analyzes how Western European travelers, diplomats, and intellectuals of the late 18th and early 19th centuries talked about Eastern Europe in their books, letters, memoirs. He found that specific ideas about the Eastern territories were repeated, so they were accepted as natural. First, the idea that crossing Europe from west to east means leaving behind the civilization and entering zone of backwardness, wildness. We can find many descriptions of filthy houses, splendid palaces, and serfs submissive to their masters. In the eyes of the visitors and observers, people there do not have any political or personal agency. They are emotional, obedient, and passive. Second, in this area, these people were not considered real Europeans. But the assumption was made that one day they would become ones. So, they were not as progressive as the western part of the Europe, but more advanced than other parts of the world. So, Eastern Europe was understood as a space that can learn and improve. It is in the process of becoming Europe. It is not true yet, but with the hope of becoming one. Thus, Eastern Europe has been considered as less Europe rather than non-Europe, and it could change. So we see how Eastern Europe becomes the one which is both inside and outside of Europe. Over the years, the Eastern Europe was attributed the mixture and variations of general characteristics I mentioned previously. For example, during the Cold War, the concept was more monolithic it belonged to a clear ideological socialist bloc and was called the Second World. After the end of the Cold War, the concept of Eastern Europe re-emerged more clearly again. The most visible this idea was in the process of EU enlargement when states from the former socialist bloc were preparing to join the organization in late 1990s and early 2000s. During this process, the dichotomy of Europe versus Eastern Europe became more apparent again. The accession process was mostly a policy reform process in the countries that wanted to join the EU. But 
Apart from the things states had to do to be able to qualify for the membership, the enlargement was also a discursive process with several features. First, it was the idea about candidate countries in the East returning to Europe, finally becoming true Europeans. So, before, before the states lacked something, and now through Europe and Euro Europeanization they get something more substantial, more real. Second, the accession process was an asymmetrical process. It was framed as a learning and socialization process. The Eastern Europeans were pupils and proper Europe was their teacher. The teacher taught appropriate norms, rules, and a way of behaving in European community. So, the Europeanization was conceived as a kind of graduation from Eastern Europe to Europe, a process in which the accession countries must prove their, that they are willing and able to internalize Western norms. The third discursive feature was the idea that Eastern Europe is constantly on the verge of failing. There is a risk of returning to its past of ethnic nationalism and focusing on traditional geopolitics with too much obsession with Russia and its threats. These worries were always supplemented with the hope that the Europeanization would contribute to the changes, would, help to go, would them help not to go back to their old ways. So again, we see the countries were considered to be located in Europe, but not European enough. The assumption was that the gap exists and must be bridged, and that Eastern Europe must and want to become a real Europe. In the 21st century, two additional new aspects regarding the concept of Eastern Europe became more prominent. First, Eastern Europe became also a self-identification category. More and more people from Europe's East started to call themselves Eastern Europeans. Some of them are proud of that, some might think about being Eastern European in a more neutral, descriptive terms, and some mean it as an ironic term. Still, the idea now is not only imposed from the outside, but supported from the inside as well. And the idea produced by the West gets appropriated, accepted, and owned by those who got that attribution. The second tendency contradicts a bit the first one and is more clearly expressed on the political level. It is the wish of those who consider it Eastern Europe to move the labels of Eastern Europe more to the East. That is to say, they are Eastern Europe and they are not. That is, the EU enlargement has divided the European continent into three layers. The first is the center of Europe, proper Europe. The second layer consists of the Central Eastern European countries, which wanted to get close to that center and became members of the EU. And the third layer is the eastern periphery without the membership, Ukraine, Moldova, and Belarus. So we see that the label of Eastern Europe exists not simply because it is imposed on certain countries, but also because these countries themselves use it to their particular Easts, emphasizing their distance from the center. These layers make the concept of Europe and Eastern Europe again even more flexible. The ideas continue to live, start to take different, more diverse forms and become more durable. This lecture is being recorded at a time when the war in Ukraine that Russia has started takes place. The reasons, effects and aftermath of this war will be discussed for many years to come. Ukraine, no doubt for many Europeans, was, was this big country in the eastern periphery. For many, most probably unknown, incomprehensible. It was, a, it was a country that had a war with Russia in 2014, 2015. It was a developing country, not yet modernized, not reformed enough, and most probably a bit exotic. In the context of our discussion about the narratives of Europe, one interesting and noteworthy moment happened after the war started. Then Russia attacked Ukraine on February 24, 2022. The headlines of many news outlets were talking about the war in Europe. The trope of Eastern Europe didn't appear as the depiction of a place where everything is happening. It was, and at the moment is clear, that the asymmetrical mental divisions and other categories vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine are not taking place. Does it mean that the category of Eastern Europe will disappear after the war? Most probably not. As I was trying to explain, the idea of Eastern Europe is quite a durable and fluid concept to disappear just at this moment. But what we see now might indicate that the transformation of the category of Eastern Europe as indicating the European other might start its transformation towards a more inclusive, more symmetrical category inside of Europe.